All right, people, here we go. Good morning. Welcome. Come on in, all of you who are in town this week. It is good to have you with us. My name is Joshua. I've got my name tag. Yes, good. It's been a long time since I've forgotten my name tag, so next week you can expect me to not have it, having said that. It's my privilege to welcome you here today to Prairie View Christian Church. We are glad that you are with us as we are worshiping the Lord together today uh, with uh, everybody here in the room. It is a Kid City Sunday. Not only that, it is Kid City Summer of Sundays. So the next five weeks, we will have the kids in here with us. Now, there are still the rooms open in case people need it, and we do have normal, regular service for the babies, and I believe also the toddlers. But preschoolers, uh, we are thrilled to have you with us all the way through this morning. It is your privilege and ours to have you with us as we worship the Lord all together, even if that does mean it's a bit of a different energy in the room. That also means we'll have, for four out of the five weeks, Zach down here with the kiddos giving a little lesson. Zach preaches next week, so we will have a special guest to do the kids' lesson, and I am nervous as heck about that, so we'll see how that goes. If you're a visitor among us, you are surely nearby to one of these green cards. At the middle point of our service, we will collect an offering. If you're a visitor with us, then your contact information is all that we ask that you provide, but you are welcome to contribute. Uh, typically, it is just for the family of Prairie View, members, regular attenders that uh, can contribute to the ongoing work of the Lord. If you are thinking about retiring your checkbook, most of the offering still comes in by check, and you're thinking, hey, the only people that I need to write a check to are my church and the HOA. Well, I can tell you on behalf of our HOA, more and more people are going to their bank online and sending a check. And if you did that and sent a check to Prairie View Christian Church, it should arrive, and we will accept it as your worshipful offering as well. So just in case you were thinking about doing that. Other events on the calendar, we have the cookout that is here today. If you left the potato salad on the counter at home, this is your chance to go back and get it. Otherwise, you can stay and enjoy the food that is here. Even if you're a guest and you didn't know, you are still welcome to stay and uh, enjoy the summer cookout with us. So uh, that'll be happening. In the next two weeks, we are less than two weeks, in fact, only 12 days away from the Ides food packing night. That's a Friday night. It's in this room. We clear out the chairs. We set up the tables. Uh, we have uh, two and a half, three hours of packing up food for the International Disaster Emergency Services Ministry, who keep it on hand until it's needed somewhere around the country or around the world in a disaster situation. We've done that probably over 10 years now on a Friday in July, packing up food for that purpose. Other routine things, the men's ministry will meet again on that same morning, Friday, July the 12th. The youth ministry is off for two more weeks until the 14th of July, and then the women's ministry will be off this week. Wednesday night is sort of a holiday eve this year, this week, so uh, Wednesday, July 10th is the next women's study. And I believe that is it for the calendar, except for the elder ballot. The elder ballot is open through the end of the day. The votes are all tending one direction. It's uh, nearly wrapped up, but everybody that is a member is what. Everybody, everybody is welcome to vote. We will only count the votes of the members. And to talk to somebody about membership, find somebody with a name tag. We are continuing in our sermon series in the book of Acts. If you walked down this hallway and saw Ben's office in total disarray and thought, oh no, he's leaving or he's been raided by the FBI, no, he's just painting. Everything is fine. He is continuing in our sermon series on Acts. And we are going to read from Psalm 36 which sort of aligns with Acts 5, kind of. Just the first nine verses of Psalm 36. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. Amen. There is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, 
In your light do we see light. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this beautiful morning and this chance to gather with your people freely and openly in this place. And Lord, I thank you that you have moved us from the beginning of that psalm to the end of that song. Lord, help us uh, to continually see that sin resides in our heart, but that because of the life you've given us, the new life in your spirit, we can, in fact, reject evil, and we are no longer needing to be bent in that direction. Lord, thank you that in the light of your word, in the light of your revelation, we see Jesus for who he is, and we see ourselves for what we are. Lord, thank you that your light leads us to the cross, where we can see Jesus who gave himself for our sins, taking the punishment on himself. And Lord, thank you that um, you've given us new life, and that we can be gathered into churches where we still see there is, in fact, a collection of sinners, uh, more or less striving to follow you. But Lord, as we see in our text this morning, uh, we do in fact still sin. Lord, help us to be turning away from our sinful ways in an increasing manner and turning to follow more after you uh, individually and collectively. It's in your great name that we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. If you are able, will you stand to sing with us? Uh, Before we sing this first song, I'm going to read from Isaiah 43. Verses 1 through 3. It said, But now thus says the Lord, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior.
this next song is going to be a new one, uh, or a new one here anyways. Um, when we sing it, we'll sing the first verse twice, uh, but before we do that, I'm going to read from Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Give me eyes to see more of who you are. May what I behold still my anxious heart. Take what I have known and break it all apart. You, my God, are greater still. We're going to sing all that again. Give me eyes to see more of who you are. May what I behold still my anxious heart. Take what I have known and break it all apart. You, my God, are greater still. In no sky contains, no doubt restrains. All oh, you are the greatness of our God. I spend my life to know. And I'm far from close to all you are, the greatness of our God. Give me grace to see beyond this moment here, to believe that there is nothing left to fear, and that you alone are high above it all. You, my God, are greater still. Yet no sky contains, no doubt strains. Oh, you are the greatness of our God. I spent my life to know, and I'm far from close to all you are. Greatness of our God, and there is nothing that could ever separate us. There is nothing that could ever separate us from Your love. No life, no death. Of this I am convinced that You, my God, are greater still. Micah 7, verses 18 and 19 say, 
Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. singing, you may be seated. And at this time, our kids can come forward and meet me down here front and center. Hang on, don't come up yet. Before you come up, make sure you grab your listening ears and your non-moving shoes. So you get up here, not your non-wiggly pants and your, and your listening ears, and then you come up here and sit down, okay? Okay. 
York. A, a beautiful Bible. Are, are we all ready to listen? You got our listening ears? I see them. You got them. All right. I want you guys to imagine, as I get this open, I want you all to imagine what it would be like to be sitting in that exact spot you're sitting in before this building was here, okay? Have you ever, have you ever thought about the fact that this building has not always been here? Has this building always been here? The building hasn't always been here. So imagine what it would be like to be sitting right where you are, but this building wasn't here. You would be in the grass, right? You'd probably be sitting in the grass. It might be a little wet, right? The morning dew might still be out there. You, 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 might, you might be sitting in some wet grass. Does that sound nice? No. no? Nah, not really. It might be, it might be a little breezy. It might, there might be a breeze. Maybe not. It might be hot out. You what? Did, are you, did you bring a seat? Are you bringing a seat? Is that what you're telling me, to sit on a rock? Is that what I heard you say? No. All right, moving on. That's my, that's, he's mine. Um, in case you can't see. <laughs> okay, you'd be in an open field. You'd be sitting in the grass. The sun would be shining on you. There might be a breeze. We would hear the cars driving by. We would hear birds, probably. Maybe not. All the birds might have left when we were singing. They would, maybe, or maybe they would have been singing with us. Either way, this building hasn't always been here, right? And as the building was being put up, as it was being built, what kind of things would you have seen then? What, what would you have seen and heard when this church building was being put together and built? Yeah, you would, you would have seen and heard hammers and nails and tools and axes. Ooh, I don't know if we would see any axes. In your, in your vision of it, we see axes, okay? We see axes, all right? We would see people working and it would have been being built, right? Um, now today, we sit here, and we sing, and we pray. Later this morning, we're going to eat. Most mornings when we're here, we play a lot when we're, we're in this building, okay? We have fun when we're here. But again, this, this church, this building hasn't always been here. And if you could travel back even further in time, before this was here, way before this was here, almost 2,000 years, we could see what it was like when the very first church got its start, right? We could travel back in time, but... Well, we can't really travel back in time, can we? Not yet. Maybe one of you will invent a time machine, and we will be able to travel back in time. But until then, we can read our Bible, and the Bible will tell us what that very, very first church was like, okay? So Jesus died, and he rose again, and he ascended into heaven to sit on his throne until he returns. And when he was doing all of that, he promised to send his Holy Spirit to his people, his disciples, everyone who trusted in him and followed him, to be their helper. And that's what he did. The Holy Spirit has come, and from the beginning, he has helped Jesus' people show and tell the world about Jesus, our King. Who, who is the helper Jesus sent? Yes, God, the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit as a helper, and that helper was helping the very first church. So the very first church, do you think it got off to a good start or a bad start? A good start, yeah. The early church got off to a really good start. But things were not always perfect. Because people, even God's people, even the people in the church, aren't always perfect. For example, the very first church was sharing everything they had with each other. If anyone had a need, any need at all, if you needed a shirt or shoes, maybe sandals, maybe a sandwich, they were taking care of each other and meeting each other's needs. They were, they were helping each other. Does that sound good? Does it sound good for the church to be helping each other? Is that a good thing? Yeah, that's a good thing. But there was a husband and wife named Ananias, kind of a funny name, and Sapphira. Can you say Ananias? Ananias. Ananias. He was the husband, and Sapphira, she was the wife. And they plotted something sneaky. They sold their land to give their money away. They were wanting to be helpful. But they kept some of the money for themselves, which wouldn't have been a problem, except that they lied. They lied to tell everyone. Yeah, what are they doing? 
They lied and told everybody that they'd given all of their money away. And they did that because they wanted to look good. They wanted to be impressive. They wanted people to be impressed with them. More than they wanted to help other people, they wanted people to think they were great. And so they lied. Do you have any guesses what happened after Ananias and Sapphira told their lie? What do you think, what do you think might have happened? They got caught. They did get caught. What do we think happened? I got some smart cookies up here. They died. Ananias and Sapphira, for, for their lie, for, for trying to lie to God, they were, they were killed. God struck them down, and they were killed. Now, have you ever told a lie? And you're still sitting here? I've told, I've told some lies, too. Unfortunately, I think everybody has told a lie. And if you say you haven't, well, you're busted, because you have. For, and fortunately, does, are, you're sitting here, right? Did God punish you the way he punished Ananias and Sapphira for telling their lie? No. No, but God takes sin very, very seriously. And we should remember, uh, for those of you who are here a few weeks ago in class, your lesson was about uh, wisdom and the fear of the Lord. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? So one of the things that the, the early church needed to learn and that Ananias and Sapphira taught them was about a fear of God, that God takes sin very seriously. God was protecting his people. He was protecting his family, his children. God did not want them to be divided by lies and sin. They weren't supposed to pretend to take care of each other. They were supposed to actually take care of each other, which gets us to another story that we're going to hear this morning. In this second story, there are two groups of people, big groups that make up the church. How many groups? How many groups were made, made up the church? Two big groups are that we're going to hear about this morning. And the thing that really split them was they spoke different languages. Have you ever been around someone who spoke a different language? We see some no's, which is fine, and we see some yeses. It can be hard to talk. It, well, it's impossible to talk to people in a different language, right? Right? And so different di people with different languages kind of tend to be in different groups because it's, it's nice to be around people you can talk with, <laughs> okay? And in the early church, there were two groups of people. There were the Hebrews, and they spoke one language, and then there were the Hellenists. Like, have, the Hellenists spoke a different language. And there were some women among the Hellenists who felt like they weren't getting their fair share of all the things that were being shared by the church, and so they came and they complained and they said, we aren't getting taken care of the way we're supposed to be taken care of. And what do you think the early church did? They helped. They didn't slam the door in their faces. They helped. They, they found people to take charge of helping those of those women, of the, the widows is what they were. So the early church had problems. They had a big problem with Ananias and Sapphira, a somewhat scary problem that reminds us that God takes sin very seriously. And they had another problem where they were supposed to be caring for each other, and they weren't. And, and did they get sad and did they give up? No. They, fi they figured it out. They fixed the problem, and they appointed leaders and people to take care of that, okay? So God's people, the church, is it, is it perfect? And why isn't, the church, why isn't the church ever perfect? Do we know? Because everyone sins. Because people aren't perfect, right? But... Bingo. But God is perfect, right? And that was the next thing I was going to say. You're on it. God is perfect. And God's perfect plans always happen according to his perfect love and his perfect power. So the early church, the very, very first church, shows us what the church has really always looked like. It's imperfect people imperfectly trying to love a perfect God. But God, we know, is working for us. In the book of Matthew, and you'll find this in your box today on your, on your page. This is your verse. In the book of Matthew, Jesus says, I will build my church. Who's going to build the church? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus will build the church. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful privilege it is to sit here um, among your people and among uh, these, these, these children, and to teach about you and to share about you, God. And there are hard things and maybe even scary things. Um, 
God, but you are not a scary God. You love us, and we know you love us because you sent your son to die for us while we were your enemies. And not only did you send your son to die for us while we, we were your enemies, you've sent your Holy Spirit to help us and guide us as we live among a difficult, crazy, confusing world to give us strength and power to show the world and tell the world what Jesus is like. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for, again, for your church and for your people. Help us to live together as a family. Help us to meet one another's needs, whether those are, um, whether those are things that we need money for or when we're sad, when we're happy, when we need maybe just a hug. God, that we as your people would share our needs with one another and, and meet those needs for each other out of our love for you and your love, more importantly, for us. God, I pray that as we continue in this service, we would um, just hear your word and that we would become more and more the people you have called us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great job this morning, everybody. You guys can return to your seats. My name is Scott, and I have the pleasure of doing the communion meditation today. Uh, down here in front, we have the cups of juice and the bread, as well as the black boxes for the offering. Uh, after the meditation and a prayer, please feel free to come down to the front and grab the juice and bread, as well as leave an offering. If you're a guest, uh, you're certainly welcome to leave, but we don't expect it from you. Um, if you could just leave one of the green communication cards, though, in the back of the seat in front of you, we'd greatly appreciate it. We could thank you for coming to worship with us today. So um, this week in the men's Bible study uh, last Friday, which, by the way, if you're at all on the fence about I highly recommend it. Joe does a great job leading that, and it's definitely worth getting up a little bit extra early every other Friday to attend. But uh, we continued the study on the cross. And this Friday, we specifically talked about the book of Mark and the section about the Last Supper. <clears throat> um, one of my favorite parts about the men's Bible study is... Brad's comments. Brad always has a lot of really insightful things to say. And Brad, I promise I won't steal all of your thoughts about communion. I'll leave you some table scraps for your next meditation. But um, Brad mentioned that one of the things that was kind of standing out to him about communion is how it is an opportunity for us to more actively participate in our worship service. It's pretty easy. Maybe there might have been one or two kids we noticed, but it's pretty easy to find ourselves during a, a service, maybe our minds start to wander or we kind of just zone out a little bit. Um, it's, I think everybody can kind of identify with that. But um, I recently was listening to a pastor tackling a question about boredom. And when God built our universe and created us, why did he make boredom a pretty much universal experience that everybody has to deal with? Uh, and we're not talking about, you know, depression or anything, but just kind of the, the ever-present feeling that we need to be entertained. You know, the thing that we are trying to escape from when we take up a hobby or go to movies or concerts or sometimes in less constructive things if we turn to drugs or affairs or even just overindulgence in using our cell phones. Um, the Bible doesn't have a ton to say directly about boredom, but it does talk a lot about restlessness. And if you had to think one spot that probably most people would think of when you think about kind of restlessness is probably the book of Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes, if we look at chapter 18, trying to figure out maybe what this is that, that God has uh, settled us with when it comes to boredom, we can read, uh, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. So we know that God has put this here. The, the pastor in the conversation I was listening to defined boredom as um, the relentless experience of not find a sat finding satisfaction in this world. So why is it that we have this boredom, this restlessness that we have to deal with? Looking back to Ecclesiastes, which again kind of tackles this the most to see maybe if there are any answers there, in chapter 3, we can read that, uh, it writes, I have seen 
that the busyness that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put into the hearts, uh, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. So that, there's a lot there, and I don't pretend to know everything that that's trying to say, but what it, it does seem to probably be at least getting at um, is that God has made us frustrated with the experience of, of living until we realize that the reason that we are here is for God. I think C.S. Lewis sums it up really well uh, when he writes, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. So if we're, if we're trying to think about, okay, the, the next time we feel that boredom start to, to creep up or feel ourselves kind of zoning out or get the itch to just check the phone and see what we might be missing out on, even though there's not really any good reason to, you, we can kind of remember that, that that's intentional. That exists because we're trying to we're trying to satisfy a restlessness that we were built with, and that that restlessness is intentionally put there to point us to God. Uh, Augustine had really hit on this when he said, uh, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. So back to communion, what we're here for now. Of all of the infinite ways that communion is significant and powerful, probably one of the lesser ones, is that it's how, it's that our, our Father knows our hearts. He knows the restlessness in our hearts, and he's given us this practice as an active way that we can participate in remembering the glory and the sacrifice that he made for us. So, as we take of the, the bread, which represents Christ's broken body, and the juice, which represents his spilled blood, um, let's remember that it's because of this sacrifice that we have an opportunity to be with him in heaven where we will be satisfied and, and no longer restless with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful morning that you've blessed us with. Thank you for the children and getting to have them experience worshiping together with us and with their families and this church family. Um, please bless this church and the offering that they will live. Please leave. Please bless the, the elders that they may put the, the funds to good use and help us to take the, the lessons that Ben will deliver to us and use them to keep our, our hearts and our minds focused on you as we begin our week. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning again. Welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. Thanks for joining us here today. If you've ever had to stay home sick from school or work, you've probably found yourself sustained by chicken noodle soup, Gatorade, and an episode, or two, or five, or ten, of Family Feud. Family Feud is one of the longest-running game shows on American television. Two households compete against each other by answering all kinds of questions and winning some various challenges. And the heat between these two opposing families can rise quickly as the game goes on. But so can the stress within each family. When something goes wrong in the game, spouses, siblings, and generations can turn their fire on each other by blaming, discouraging, and insulting one another. In this game, one can't family can't just focus on defeating the other family. In the end, the family that wins is the one that learns how to navigate conflict, how to ease tension, and how to work together. And as we saw in Acts chapters 2 and 4 last week, the early church is a lot like a family. The believers learn together, worship together, and pray together. They share their possessions, their homes, and their meals to a degree that may even make us uncomfortable. That's why the Apostle Paul calls the church a household of God. That's why we call each other brothers and sisters. That's why we may even have people we call our spiritual parents, because we really are a family. And that sense of community, the family-like atmosphere that we see at work in the early church is both beautiful and challenging to modern Christians like us. It's something we aspire to, but something that we almost always feel that we fall short of. But we also know that even the most peaceful, happy, and healthy families in our world have their occasional feuds. And today we learn that like any family, the early church, which seems so perfect in chapters 2 and 4, sometimes had to deal with conflict too. Specifically, Acts 5 and 6 tell us about two events, really two scandals, that once threatened the early church's mission. And these stories can warn us, teach us, and encourage us as we encounter our own family feuds, as we address our own scandals, and as we press on in our mission to bear witness about Jesus to the end of the earth. So open your Bible to Acts chapter 5, verse 1. Feel free to use one of our Bibles if you didn't bring one, and take a Bible home if you don't have one. But before we go further, let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who justifies us. Thank you for your spirit, who sanctifies us. And Lord, thank you that we look forward to being in your eternal, glorious, perfect presence. And thank you that on Sunday morning, we can get even just the smallest taste of what that is like. We can gather with your people from all walks of life and all backgrounds, we can sing songs together with one voice. We can listen to your word. We can be reminded of Christ's broken body and shed blood in the bread and juice of communion. Thank you for everything Sunday morning is. Thank you for the family that gathers here every week. And thank you that we have the privilege of being a part of your much broader family, the church across time and space. I pray that you would bless this church specifically but bless your church generally. Help us be outposts of your kingdom in a world that is far from you. Help us be salt and light in a world that is decaying and getting dark. Lord, help us represent you well in this world. And part of that is learning, the kind of stuff that we'll learn about this morning, dealing with conflict, dealing with division, dealing with sin within the church. So, Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what your word has to say, even from difficult stories. 
and help us be the church you call us to be. Slowly but surely, even with our faults and even with our flaws that are certainly present in me and in us and in this church, help us be the church you call us to be by your Spirit's power and by your grace when we fall short. We love you. We pray for these people. We thank you for this place. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, before we jump into chapter 5, let's quickly revisit the end of chapter 4, starting in verse 34. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, A Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we ended on a real high note last week with this guy named Barnabas. He is a particularly inspiring example of generosity within the early church. Barnabas sells his property and gives his proceeds to the apostles. And it's extremely important to remember that no one forced him to do this. Barnabas chose to do it. And when he does, he is rightfully praised within the community. But sadly, not everyone in the church, not all in the family, are like Barnabas. And it turns out that one of the greatest threats to the church's mission isn't persecution from the outside, like we read about in chapters 3 and 4, but sin on the inside. So, chapter 5, starting in verse 1. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira, they're being contrasted with Barnabas. Barnabas shows up at the end of chapter 4, Ananias and Sapphira at the beginning of chapter 5. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Remember our sermon a few weeks ago on the imprecatory psalms? Well, this story is like an imprecatory psalm of the New Testament. You're calmly gliding along in the book of Acts, taking in this wonderful story about the early church's success, and then you're shocked by this. But before we get too disturbed by the story of Ananias and Sapphira, we should at least establish the facts of the situation. Like Barnabas at the end of chapter 4, Ananias and Sapphira were under no obligation to sell their property and give the proceeds to the church. If they did, it was purely their own decision, 
not something forced upon them by anybody else. Next, Ananias and Sapphira's sin was not that they didn't give everything. That's not the sin. Likewise, their sin was not that they didn't give more. Their sin was pretending that they gave all of the proceeds of the sale, when in reality they only gave some. In doing so, they lied to the apostles, they lied to their siblings in Christ, and most importantly, they lied to God himself. On top of that, Ananias and Sapphira planned this together. That's stressed in places like verse 2 and in verse 8. This was not some momentary lapse of judgment by these two people. It was agreed upon, thought out, and deliberate by both of them. And when the apostle Peter presses Sapphira on it and gives her a chance to come clean, she doubles down. And finally, Peter did not kill Ananias or Sapphira. The way the story tells it makes it clear that God judged them. And yes, his judgment is stunningly swift in this story. And as a result, it's tempting to question his mercy, patience, and grace. But really, the fact that God doesn't do this more often is a testament to his mercy, patience, and grace. How many other people in the Bible have committed similar sins to Ananias and Sapphira's and not immediately died? How many of us have committed similar deliberate and public sins and lived to tell about it? But with all that said, the question remains, why were Ananias and Sapphira the exception to the rule? Why were they judged so swiftly? Well, a few possibilities. First, Satan was involved. We see that mentioned in verse 3. As we've seen so far, the early church has been wildly successful. And perhaps Peter believes that the devil is trying to infiltrate it. Therefore, his influence must be nipped in the bud. And just for the record, there's another story in the Bible where a husband and wife are influenced by Satan to sin against God, and the damage is still seen today. Their names were Adam and Eve. Second, Ananias and Sapphira's fate may come because of how public their sin was. If sin so bold and so audacious goes unchecked, others in the church would inevitably be tempted to follow suit. The testing of the Lord and the testing of the apostles would only increase with time. And third, the church's mission is on the line. In Joshua chapter 7, as the people of Israel are settling the promised land, a man named Achan commits a very similar sin to what Ananias and Sapphira did. And when he does, the entire nation of Israel is put at risk. God then makes it clear to Joshua that until they handle this, their conquest will fail. Likewise, if sin is taken lightly in a church, God's people will not accomplish their mission. Now, do all those facts and all those nuances eliminate our discomfort with this story? No. But then again, this story isn't supposed to give us comfort to begin with. It's supposed to give us a healthy degree of fear. That's stressed in verses 5 and 11. This event is supposed to remind us that God is just as holy and sin is just as bad in the New Testament as they are in the Old Testament. And while fear should not be the entire basis of a Christian's relationship with God, it shouldn't be totally absent either. So there's scandal number one, Ananias and Sapphira, and their internal sin. If this had not been addressed rightly, 
If the early Christians ceased to fear God, it would have threatened the church's mission as much as any external persecution. And in the big scheme of things, if a church acts as though sin isn't really all that bad, it implicitly sends the message that what Jesus did isn't really all that great. But what's scandal number two? Well, this one is division. Our second story is less shocking, and the events are less sensational. But make no mistake, letting division simmer within a church can be just as dangerous to a church's mission as turning a blind eye to sin. So chapter 6, verse 1. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty." but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. So as the church expanded, it inevitably became more diverse. And with all the richness that diversity can provide a community, it also comes with growing pains. And in this case, we have two groups feuding within the family, the Hellenists and the Hebrews. The Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews, while the Hebrews were Aramaic-speaking Jews. And keep in mind that we're still a few chapters away from thoroughly non-Jewish believers, a.k.a. Gentiles, being included in the early church. Some of these Hellenists may have been ethnically non-Jewish people who had converted to Jewish faith and customs. That's what that word proselyte means at the end of the passage. If so, they likely had some significant theological and cultural differences from the Hebrews on top of the language barrier. But the conflict arises when the Hellenists feel like their widows are being neglected. It's an example of the kind of favoritism within the early church that the book of James warns us against. But thankfully, this scandal is dealt with just as swiftly as the Ananias and Sapphira scandal. And this time, no one dies. There's an old saying that necessity is the mother of invention. In other words, problems lead to solutions. Desperation produces innovation. And in this case, the problem of some people within the church being neglected leads to the solution of deacons. These servants were appointed to focus on the practical needs of the church, That way, the apostles could focus on teaching, preaching, and praying, the stuff that they're good at. Prairie View's administration team fills a similar role. That way, elders and pastors can focus on our primary responsibilities. But back then, everyone was pleased with the solution, the feud came to an end, and the latest family crisis was averted. So in many ways, the early church was a picturesque community. It really was the kind of household of God that all Christians today wish our churches could be more like. But as he writes the book of, Luke, book of Acts, Luke does not seem interested in painting a false picture of a perfect church. Sin arose from within. Division had to be addressed. They had their fair share of family feuds that could have hurt their reputation without and torn them apart from within. And if churches today don't address our family feuds rightly, 
If we turn a blind eye to sin, or if we allow divisions to fester, we can harm our reputation outside and be torn apart inside. And if we do that, our mission will be in peril. So then what lessons should we take away from these stories of scandal? Well, first, these stories warn us about scandal. If the early church had problems with internal sin and division, it's safe to say that so will ours. It's not a question of if, but when. So while we should do everything in our power to avoid scandal, and if a new one were to pop up every other week, it would indicate that something's wrong beneath the hood, we also shouldn't be surprised by scandals. No church is perfect, not even the one in the book of Acts. That's because the people who make up churches aren't perfect. We're all sinners. And though we're declared righteous by faith in Christ's broken body and shed blood, though we're slowly but surely growing in righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit, and though we will one day be perfectly righteous in God's presence, the truth remains that sin isn't totally out of the picture quite yet. That means that we can fall into the same traps that the early church did. And we can fall into the same traps that other churches do. Scandals within the church should worry us, but they should not shock us. Why? Because we've been warned. But second, these stories are included to teach us. Specifically, they give us some practical guidance on how to handle these kinds of situations when they arise, which, as we just said, they will. How did the early church handle them? They had godly, courageous, and thoughtful leaders who took sin seriously and held people accountable for it. And when divisions within the church became apparent, those leaders found ways to address the problem and reconcile the opposing parties. Now, do these stories give us a detailed playbook for how to handle every conflict that could ever come up? No. But they give us a starting point. They teach us some of the basics of how to deal with scandal and show us that when navigated appropriately, scandals don't have to destroy the church. And along those lines, third, these stories are included to encourage us. We've said a few times now that if the early church had not addressed these problems rightly, their mission would have been at risk. However, the verses immediately following both stories show us how God blessed their efforts even after they stumbled. Look at chapter 5, starting in verse 12, right after Ananias and Sapphira. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed." If you look again at verses 13 and 14, it's interesting. Verse 13 says, nobody joined them. But then verse 14 says, lots of people joined them. What's happening there? Well, I suspect that the Ananias and Sapphira event started to weed some people out. That maybe there were people in the early church who weren't serious about following Christ. Maybe there were people who were joining the church just because it seemed like the trendy thing to do at the time. That comes to an end after Ananias and Sapphira. But now look at chapter 6, verse 7. This is right after the division. 
The word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Do you think the word of God would have continued to increase and their numbers would have continued to increase if they allowed that division to just rot them from the inside out? Probably not. You know, it's easy to get discouraged when we see churches fold, when we see pastors fall, and when we see once beautiful sanctuaries become microbreweries. That often happens when churches fail to handle conflict and fail to handle scandals wisely. But we should be encouraged by the fact that if churches do the hard work of addressing this stuff rightly, God can see them through that storm. God can bless them. And God can continue to use them in his mission to the end of the earth. We're not perfect And we don't have to be. That doesn't mean that scandals are no big deal. But it does mean that they don't have to be the end of the line. And that is cause for hope. The second half of chapter 5 features another story like the one we read in chapters 3 and 4. The religious leaders hear the apostles preaching about Jesus. They throw them in jail. God miraculously frees them, and a confrontation ensues. But there's a really interesting segment of the story where a Pharisee named Gamaliel cautions his fellow religious leaders against persecuting the Christians. Why? Verse 38, Gamaliel says, In the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. We said last week that the church is a product of God's power and grace, not just human effort or passion or brilliance. That's why persecution from without and scandal from within can't stop it. Those things might be able to stop a church, but they can't stop the church. Gamaliel recognized that if the early church really was God's mission, they would be fools to stand in its way. And if we recognize the same thing, we don't give up hope when the church seems less like a spirit-filled community and more like a dysfunctional family. So yes, while we should strive to be holy, we should also know that no church is perfect. But even when we stumble, which we will, the gates of hell cannot prevail against God's church. Even our worst family feuds cannot stop God's mission to the end of the earth. And that is good news for us because we're not perfect. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we've had together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the reminder that your mission to the end of the earth is not all up to us. It's not all up to us doing everything right and saying everything right and being perfect all the time. Of course we strive for holiness. Of course we strive for righteousness. Of course we want to be like the early church in so many ways, but... Remind us, Lord, that we will fail. We will mess up. We will fall short. Whether it's sin, whether it's division, whatever it is that causes us to stumble, we won't be perfect. And Lord, thank you that your mission is not entirely dependent upon us. That you are gracious, you are powerful, you are more than capable of continuing your mission in the world even when we shoot ourselves in the foot, which churches and Christians so often do. So Lord, I pray that not if or when we fall short, I pray that you would forgive us of our sins. I pray that you would give us the wisdom and the courage to handle things rightly. 
And I pray that you would see us through storms as a church. You've done so in the past, and we pray that you would do so again in the future. Not if, but when we need your help. Lord, again, I pray that you'd help us be a church that honors you, help us glorify you in our community, help us love one another, because as we've seen, internal issues can be just as dangerous as external opposition. But Lord, help us be the church you call us to be in this time and place for your glory. In the name of Christ, by the power of your spirit, amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. service for the morning. However, we are having lunch in the sanctuary after church. So here in just a moment after I pray, I'm sure there will be people scurrying around to move chairs and lay out tables and all that kind of stuff. So if you can help, great. We'd appreciate the help. Uh, If you brought food, thank you for bringing it. We hope you'll stay. And even if you didn't bring food and had no idea this was happening, you can still stay for lunch. You're more than welcome to eat with us. And if you have any questions about what it means to be a follower of Christ, what you've seen, what you've heard, we would love to have those conversations with you after the service or pray with you. So find someone with a name tag or just find a friendly face. So with that, I will close our service in prayer. And again, we hope to see you next week.
Father, again, thank you for this time we've had together. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your spirit, your word, and your church. As imperfect as your church has been in the past and currently is and surely will be in the future. Uh, Lord, thank you that you work through your church despite our sins, despite our flaws, and that is just a testimony to your power and your grace and your goodness. So Lord, help us strive to be holy, but not put so much pressure on ourselves to be perfect, because we won't be. In the meantime, as we wait for Christ to return, when we actually finally are perfect in your presence, help us be faithful through the ups and downs, through the stumblings, through the failures. Help us be faithful. Again, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for this church, your church, your son Jesus, and your Holy Spirit. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He's the great things we will sing.